What's going on, guys? It's your Javi David St. Clair Speaks, and you are now tuned in to the St. Clair Speaks Show. You are now tuned in to the St. Clair Speaks Show. Welcome back to the St. Clair Speaks Show podcast. I'm your host, Yahavi St. Clair, sitting down with another awesome guest. There's a doctor in the building, right? And there's also an author in the building, and she is all in one super. I am sitting down with Dr. Claire, um, Dr. Dr. Claire Eunice. What is such a tongue twister? I'm super excited to talk to uh, Claire today. Today, we're going to actually talk about a couple of things. There's a lot of things to talk about. First thing that we're going to talk about is the inspiration behind creating her now book that's out now titled Balance Pedal, A Breath, A Journey Through Medical School. Super excited to learn about the inspiration behind writing the book, her journey in the medical field. I'm a super fan of Grey's Anatomy. I want to know if, if, if it's really like that in the process of studying in med school and all of that good stuff, but I'm um, super passionate about storytelling. And of course, I would love to hear uh, Claire's story and how she got to this point today and um, what brings her on to the show. With that being said, Claire, I want to welcome you onto the St. Clair Speaks Show podcast. Please give our listeners a three to five minute introduction on yourself, your brand, your business, and this amazing book that you just published. Thank you so much, Yahavi. I am thrilled to be here. I really appreciate you having me on the show. Um, I am a pediatrician now, but the book is very much about my process of getting to even become a doctor. I wrote most of this book actually while I was in medical school many years ago. Um, as I went through the process of becoming a doctor, I kept thinking that these were stories that needed to be written down and I was so afraid I would forget them that I actually took time off during medical school to write most of this book. So it's written very much in real time. And as I went through the emotional transformation as well as the educational transformation of becoming a doctor, um, I kept thinking as I went through it that if everybody could understand what doctors went through, that there would be so much, such better understanding between patients and doctors. And so even from that time before I even got my degree, I felt like this was a story that, or these were stories that people needed to hear. They needed to understand the um, emotional demands, but also the emotional evolution that you go through when you're faced with questions of life and death, mortality, illness, um, but also what it means to bring your most compassionate self forward every day, or at least to aspire to do that, which of course um, is its own challenge in medicine. So I wrote most of the book back then, but I didn't quite finish it. I went on to residency in pediatrics and then starting in practice and getting married and having young kids and the book kind of sat. And finally, um, with the pandemic, we all have our pandemic projects and mine was, I am going to finish this book. Um, of course, during that time, the healthcare climate changed completely. So at the time I wrote it, I feel like, um, well, I also was very young and new in practice, so I didn't know very much about what it was like to be in practice. But when I came back to it, we were facing this pandemic. We went from doctors are heroes to doctors are evil uh, very quickly. And I thought there's no better time to try to improve understanding than now. And this story that I had honed during a graduate school course, um, or actually a graduate degree that I got back, in, back at that time, um, really needed to see the light of day. So um, I think that's my, that's my introduction to how I came to be an author um, as well as a pediatrician. I'll throw one more thing in there, and that is that about a year before the pandemic, I looked up and said, okay, I need to do something else with myself. I, I'd gotten comfortable enough in practice that I felt like it was time to take another step, whether it was educationally, getting a fellowship or something. And I really was starting to return to writing at that point and realized that writing and literature has a lot to offer doctors who are facing symptoms of burnout. And so I also had started to create some coursework related to literature in medicine. All right. So one of my favorite questions to ask on my podcast, Claire, is teachable moments. What have been some teachable moments in the process of writing a book? Like what has writing a book taught you in the process? And are there any similarities in the process of writing a book and medical school? Wow, that is a great question. So, I mean, teachable moments, I think the first thing that I learned or one of the most important things you learn is don't be too in love with your own voice. Um, yeah. And you really, you have so much that you want to convey. And 
it's impossible to write it all down and have it just be perfect the first time. So this book went through so many edits and it took a little bit of time and distance to be able to really hone what was important and essentially me and my voice and what was, you know, me just being a little too in love with the experience I was trying to portray or the way I was trying to portray it. Um, so, and then I think that's a really difficult thing as a writer. It's such a personal act and it's such an important thing to get those words out while they're fresh and not edit yourself. And then there has to be an editing process. And so when you're really trying to get a book ready for publication, sometimes you have gorgeous passages that you're so proud of that end up on the proverbial cutting room floor, right? They just didn't belong in the story. Um, how does that relate to medical school? Gosh, that's a good question. Um, I guess the main thing I would say there is all of us come into our experiences with preconceived notions of what is what we're doing, what it is going to mean, and what we hope to mean. And I think going into medical school, probably many of us have this ideal that we're going to be of service to all patients, that we're going to be able to heal, and we're going to have this amazing power to make things right. And um, I think that's one of the harsh early lessons is that you may have all the knowledge in the world and that doesn't make you able to heal everybody. Um, and even having your heart 100% in the right place doesn't necessarily make you the right doctor for everybody or the right person to help everybody. Mm. So since we're on that topic, I, I wanna ask you this question. And this is something, I guess I talked about this maybe a, a couple of times and I see it on like TV shows and like so many shows where it's like, you know, they have people in the medical field. How do you, how do you detach, right? That you being the human being where like you, 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 you empathize and you sympathize with um, just everyone that, that, that you work with in that field. Mm -hmm. How do you stay above float and, and not beat yourself down emotionally? Because I just interviewed someone on the podcast a couple of days ago and we were talking about emotional intelligence. So, mm -hmm. How do you balance that out so well? Because I've heard that, you know, in some cases, some doctors are depressed because of the line of work, because they don't know how to separate. So how have you been able to do that so well? Ooh, that is a lifelong pursuit. <laughs> I think being able to figure out how to do that and, and importantly, how not to do that too much. So I think there's actually more danger in depersonalizing excessively than there is in allowing yourself to feel. Um, one of the things that happens as you go through training and as you are a doctor is you do see a lot of suffering and you realize that it can't all be fixed. And so there's a certain element of acceptance that comes with that, um, that makes it, it's never easy to absorb suffering, but it, um, it balances you a little bit in your ability to realize that there's a lot of suffering in the world and we do our very best to ease that and to make it um, as manageable as we can for people. The other piece of that is that we have a specific role in a healthcare setting, right? We may feel as deeply as the next person, but we also have a real responsibility to use our training and our knowledge to help make the situation as good as we can to figure out how best to manage a situation. So um, I think having that role allows us to, or requires us to take a little bit of a step back enough to keep our heads about us and be able to be of service because we're useless. If we just fall into the emotion completely, then who's going to make those medical decisions? Who's going to try to fix the situation? Not everybody in that room can do that. And so when you have that responsibility, I guess it makes it a little bit more possible to be like, okay, for right now, I'm gonna put on my, my intellectual head and try to fix the situation as best I can. Uh, it doesn't mean that there isn't the compassion there. And I think one of the um, fallacies is that people think, oh, the doctor just doesn't care or doctors don't care enough. And that's not really true. It's just that somebody has to be the person in the room to figure out what, what has to happen next. Once we get through that acute moment or that stabilizing moment, then I really think there's quite an important role for holding hands and um, empathizing with our patients. That's critically important. That's, that's why we did this, right? And sometimes the most healing thing that we can do is simply to be present and share in those feelings. Uh, so 
on this on this point, you know, I was just looking at your again the title of your your book, right? Balance, pedal, breathe, and that just that speaks to exactly what you just mentioned, right? Like you you from my representation, maybe it's like you're finding your balance, you're breathing, you're pedaling, you're 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 staying above flow. Can you tell us a little bit more on that? On like why that specific title and what does that relate to? Absolutely. So um, <laughs> the, I was not a typical medical student in that after college, I took a year off to go um, live in a ski town, be a ski instructor, um, wait tables, not really be responsible or do research or do all the things you're supposed to do. And part of that was me de-stressing from undergrad. Part of it was really an acknowledgement that I am a very um, kinesthetic person. I really, I'm, I'm, I love mountain biking and rock climbing and um, all kinds of outdoor skiing, all kinds of outdoor sports. And I really just wanted to indulge myself in that year. And then I went to medical school and found out that I was going to work harder than I ever had in my life. And I think my fear of completely committing to medical school was that I would lose track of who I was otherwise. I would lose track of that person who just loved to be out in the wilderness and away from people <laughs> in the process of trying to be someone who would be of help to people. So the book. Um, is actually very much about those outdoor pursuits. And so in each chapter, as I go through the different clinical rotations, I'm also talking about other experiences I've had. So my pediatrics rotation is as much about being a foreign exchange student as it is about being a pediatrician. And um, the surgery chapter is actually very much about swing dancing, um, which you wouldn't expect, right? What does that have to do with surgery? But for me at that time, it had everything to do with it. It was how I balanced the different kinds of touch, the touch that you use when you're operating on someone is very different from the touch that you use when you're trying to be responsive in a partner dance. Um, so the title really comes from um, a quote in the book um, that's from second year in which mountain biking was really my salvation. And I had to, I could only study for a couple hours at a time and then I had to get out. And so I was mountain biking to save my soul, <laughs> if that makes any sense, or to just stay in touch with myself as a human while I was going through this process, it's very dehumanizing to be faced with an absolutely unknowable mass of information um, and know that if you don't pass the tests, then it's just too bad and, and you're done. Um, so for me, peddling that, that, middle, that middle part of the title was really critical to maintaining my balance and maintaining my ability to know what was important and what was right in medical school. Um, balance obviously is what we're all seeking, I think, throughout our lives. And breathe. Breath is essential to everything, right? It's how we center ourselves to face things that are difficult. It's how we recover when we've had something challenging go on. It is um, the life force. And it was something that I was so focused on and so many of the experiences I had as I went through medical school. What do you love most about what you do, Claire? <laughs> um, well, to answer that, you have to know what I do. <laughs> so, uh, so br bring up, like, bring us in, like, catch me up to how you got to this point. What do you do, and what do you love most about what you do? Um. What I love most about my life right now is that I'm doing several different things. So I am a pediatrician part time, and I love my encounters with my patients. I love that um, I see children at all different ages and stages from newborn all the way through late adolescence. I love seeing them grow and change and evolve through their lives. I also wear a different hat and that's that I teach some literature and medicine classes to my colleagues. So I'm actually teaching literature classes and some writing classes to them. And I love that as well because it's really a way to help clinicians access another side of themselves, access how they're feeling and thinking and, and doing through literature that may have nothing to do with medicine. Um, but it's a way to connect with other clinicians and connect them with the creative side um, that some of them haven't really paid attention to for many years. So that is intensely rewarding for me and just such a fantastic um, way to devote myself to countering burnout in other clinicians. I feel like that's something that I've enjoyed dedicating time to. And then um, 
I enjoy writing, of course. Uh, I'm so happy to have reconnected with that opportunity. It helps me make sense of things that I see. It helps me, you asked about how do you retain compassion? It helps me process difficult things that we see as doctors or difficult situations. Um, writing about them is an outlet that allows me to stay emotionally present, I think, for the next patient and the next one, the next one. Um, and then finally, I'm a clinician communication coach. So I actually will work with other doctors on um, having meaningful patient interactions. So I feel like all those things kind of work together to keep meaning um, front of mind in my life and in my practice. Man, that's awesome, Clara. That's awesome. So my next question for you is, um, you mentioned something like this really big it's like a trigger word for me, burnout, right? So what advice would you give any students in the process right now that are currently in med school or considering it? What, what advice would you give them in that journey? Mm -hmm. um, I think the most important advice is not to lose track of who you are separate from medical school. And that's easily said and difficult to do. Um, my dad used to say to me, oh, medicine is a jealous mistress because as you start to see patients and you start to gain some proficiency in medicine, it can be really intoxicating and you can completely lose yourself in medicine and completely define yourself by what you do um, as a healthcare, as someone in healthcare, whether it's as a doctor or nurse practitioner or whatever, as a nurse, whatever it may be. Um, so my advice is the opposite of Sheryl Sandberg's. It's lean out. Make sure that you're getting out regularly and doing something that reminds you of who you are separate from medicine. That deserves to be honed and um, nurtured as much as your medical self because there will be a time, whether it's right away or later on, that you really need to be reminded that medicine isn't everything. Yeah, that's deep. That's deep. Because, I mean, I mean, with a career, in that field in particular, it's very easy to, to have more work and less work-life balance, right? You know, you're there all day, you're at the hospital all day, you're, you're in the field all day. And again, like I'm just, you know, from outside looking in, you know, and I, I go based on, you know, just what I see and what I hear. I'm like, it's, as you said, it's very easy to get, you know, just lost in the process. You said... You, you found yourself in the process. It was very easy for you to be anchored down. But I want to talk to you about the corporate influence. How has the corporate influence and the use of electronic health uh, records impacted the current status of medical care today in 2022? That you have uh, hit right on a real hot button issue. Um, I think the health record is less the issue than kind of the infrastructure that goes behind it. Medicine has been increasingly commoditized. Um, and the result of that is that patient interactions are more and more seen as transactions or transactional instead of as healing encounters. Um, so I can remember back, and I don't feel like I'm that old, but maybe I am. I can remember back when I went to the doctor and I had a problem he wasn't sure about. He's like, you know what? I'm going to go grab my textbook. I'll be right back. And we kind of puzzled through it together. And it was a really, I think, ridiculously long visit probably and that you'd never see today, right? Whereas now everybody is pushed to have high productivity, see as many patients as possible. You're being rated on whether, so on likability with patients, but then also on your production. How many patients can you see in an hour? How much can you bill? All of this is um, way more business oriented than most of us intended when we went into medicine. So the health, electronic health record by itself is an instrument, right? It's a way to make records readable, supposedly, and more legible than handwritten records. And so by itself, it seems like a great idea. The problem is what's being done with that information. Um, and now the electronic record is um, easily transferable. That's a great thing, right? If you switch doctors, if you move, that record can go with you. And that's a good thing. But if it's also being used um, as a barrier, like you walk in the room and you see your doctor and the computer is between you and your doctor, well, then we have a problem, right? So it changes the dynamics of a, of a meeting. Um, 
And so there's some tricks. And that's part of what I do as a communication coach too, is there's some tricks to how you can use that record so that it's actually shared. For example, if I'm using it to show a patient their lab values, well then that's a really useful tool, right? And it's actually helping that encounter. Whereas if I'm just you know turning my back to the patient so I can type over here, then it's really gotten in the way of that patient doctor relationship. Um, so that was kind of a long-winded and roundabout answer to your question. The computer itself isn't necessarily the problem, but how it's getting used can be problematic for sure. No, I, I always I always appreciate the long form uh, answers on questions. Always helpful. So I want to swing back to something that you said way earlier in the podcast. You mentioned during the pandemic, right? Um, that's when you were writing and you, you really put the pen to pad. I want to talk to you about that entire time in the pandemic, um, how were you able to, what's the word I'm looking for, stay so calm in, in a situation where everyone was just moving hectic and there was a lot of misinformation out there? Mm -hmm. How were you able to stay so composed in, I would probably say, one of the most challenging times I've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. Well, after 9-11, but in my adulthood, this is something I've never experienced before. How are you able to stay so, so composed personally and professionally in that field with all this information going on? Mm -hmm. Boy, those are good questions. So um, I have a couple of thoughts about that. One is simply by sitting down and writing. Um, I think I have always wanted to have more time for writing and I am also, you know, I'm also a parent. So I, I have a lot going on when I'm not at work, I'm at home and I'm taking care of a household and all of that stuff. And so writing was always something that I could barely do or I really only did when it felt like a pimple needed to be popped and I really had to write about it so I could make sense of what was going on in my life. Um, and then suddenly this time opened up and I found that I had a lot to say and a lot of reflections and writing helps me stay composed because it's called writing for discovery where you just start writing and see where your brain goes. But I found that I was able to figure out the things that were bothering me and what was bothering me about it and kind of come to peace with uncertainty um, through that process of writing. Um, it was not by any stretch the imagination easy. And I would say on a more personal level, um, being a doctor during that time when people had very strong opinions that were politically motivated, there were friendships that really just evaporated because of the pandemic, because I was on board with wearing masks and some people weren't, right? And they felt very strongly that this was some kind of conspiracy. And I'm looking at the science going, no, this actually is what makes sense. So, um, you know, to say I, I remained composed doesn't mean that there wasn't a certain amount of, um, pain and difficulty that went into that. Um, but there was also gratitude on my part that this was a chance to take a step back and, and write and have time with the family and realize that there's a lot to be grateful for, even when the world as we know it, or maybe especially when the world as we know it um, implodes a little bit. Um, professionally, there's really no doubt we take an oath. We will take care of our patients. So there wasn't a lot of decision making to do there. We continued to show up. It was scary for a while there, um, for sure. And it felt a little bit like, you know, is this when we all, you know, get taken down by something we don't fully understand? Um, but they're really, I mean, as far as I can, I can't think of any doctor I know who questioned that you have to show up. And so we just do, that's what we do. <laughs> Good answer, Claire. Good answer. Um, on this topic, I want to talk to you about the future, right? The future is always promising. Mm -hmm. The future of medicine, the future of what, like, just, just what are you, what are your thoughts? If I, I, I don't want, you don't have to go too much in depth, but in terms of like, for example, there's this app that I have on my phone and I can schedule a doctor's appointment, ZocDoc, right? So like there's apps like that, like f future of medicine, like how do you see um, medicine in the next five to 10 years? Because I just like the fact that I can make a doctor's appointment off my smartphone. I think that's pretty cool versus having to call in. So where do you see the future of medicine going forward? 
Um, I would like to be Pollyanna about this, but I'm not. <laughs> um, I think our, medicine, our medical system is very broken. Um, what's good, so if we look at the positive, absolutely. Being able to have a video visit or a phone visit, we haven't been able to do that in the past because insurers wouldn't allow it. They wouldn't pay for it. So even though the technology existed, you couldn't get a video visit with your doctor and have it paid for in most circumstances. Whereas now it's pretty universal. Um, and that's been a huge boon. You know, I have teenagers, for example, who don't have a ride to get to my office, but we need to talk about something. We can have a video visit and I get to see their rooms and know kind of what they what they look like in their natural environments. Like there's some fantastic things that we are seeing that are coming out of technology and the fact that the pandemic forced the hands of the insurance companies to allow us to do this as a way to see our patients. So there's that. And I think that that will continue. I think that's kind of a genie you can't put back in the box. It's way too popular for patients to be able to have those kind of visits from the comfort of their own homes. So that's a positive. Um, overall, the medical system is ridiculous. All of the money, or not all the money, but a lot of the money is going to insurers. And if you look at medical spending over the past decades, um, Every year, the amount of money people spend on health care is going up astronomically, but the amount that doctors, hospitals, nurses, the people who are actually providing the care get paid has not gone up. So all of that money is going to the administration of, med of medical care, not to the actual people providing medical care. And it's not a tenable situation. Um, doctors are burning out. Many are leaving health care. You're not going to be able to see a doctor for many cases if this keeps up. Um, at some point, there's going to have to be an event that changes things. I think it's going to have to be a little bit like a pandemic that just blows it all up because I don't think it's going to change gradually in the right direction. Um, and I, yeah, I wish I had a crystal ball to see how that could possibly happen. I think like many doctors, I, um, I have chosen to just focus on my own, my own situation, my own world. What can I do to make my patient encounters meaningful and my um, experience meaningful? And that's, I mean, we can also argue that's the problem, right? Because we aren't ad activists, we aren't uh, business people, we aren't good at, you know, trying to dismantle this ourselves from the inside. But it's going to take a lot more than doctors speaking up. It's going to have to come from the public saying, "No more. We're not going to keep paying for." this glut of administration and lack of improvement in medical care. Man, sometimes you just gotta let that one just breathe for a little bit because I got another question for you. And I wanna, I wanna talk to you about something I mentioned before, but now I wanna dive into it about burnout, right? What are some easy tips to burnout uh, prevention, right? To, to, to avoid even going down that hill? Yeah, so, um, I really think creativity is an antidote to burnout. I think that it's so important for people to be in touch with their creative sides. And for me, that's writing. But for someone else, that may be music. It may be art. It may be, um, goodness, all kinds of all kinds of crafty or um, other pursuits. But it is so so important to have creativity in our lives as a reminder, because that's when your mind is free, right? So the more regulated medicine is and the more that we are required to check this box and that box and do this process and, and the more um, regulated that we are in our work lives, the less room there is for creativity. And I really feel that everybody has a creative side to them. Everybody needs that ability to, and, and it's also about agency, right? Agency and creativity are linked. Your ability to make a choice. How do you want to do something? What is your particular style or your particular way of making sense of something? Um, the less we have agency in medicine, the more we see burnout. The less we have agency, the less we're able to express our creativity. So I really think creativity is a really important aspect to countering that burnout. For me personally, I also have to work part time. So I can be fully present and love my work working per full, sorry, working part time. But if you made me go to work every day from eight to five, you would not see the same me. <laughs> um, and a lot of that has to do with the lack of agency. It has to do with being overregulated um, and the constant pressure to hurry, 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 see more people, be faster, be on time, make sure you get a good rating, make sure you do this, make sure you do that. There's, we all need to be in charge of our own lives and our own, our own decision making. And the less that is available in medicine, the more we need to create that in another aspect of our lives. Mm. 
Woo. With that being said, Claire, this was a lot of fun. <laughs> closing, closing thoughts. I know we, we, we touched on a lot today. Um, for the listeners and for the viewers, if you could gift wrap and bow tie all of this, right? What is the takeaway message that you want everyone to know from listening to your story and, and, and hearing you talk about your book and your passion? One takeaway, huh? Um, <laughs> I think that, um, I think if we are able to stay in touch with the meaning behind our choices and having our work be meaningful, the rest of it can follow rather naturally. As we, if we lose track of the reason that we're doing things, or if we go to work and we feel like we are going through the motions and we're not in touch with the compassion that brought us there, then it's time to look for something different. It's time to make a change. And there are options out there. Um, for me, it turned out to be writing and it is such a delightful thing to bring to other people, but there are other creative avenues and every everyone, doctors, but also other clinicians, other people, everyone deserves to feel like they're in charge of their own lives. Um, and, and they need to be able to bring creativity back around into their lives so that they can prevent those symptoms of burnout from creeping in and taking over the joy in their professions. Claire, where can we follow you and keep up with um, all the amazing work that you're doing? Thank you so much. Um, on socials, I'm at Literary Art in Medicine. Um, so that's on Facebook and um, Instagram. Not doing much with Twitter yet, but also I'm, I'm just peeking into um, LinkedIn. Um, also, my website is uh, just ClaireUnis.net. So C L A I R E U N I S.net. Um, and from there, there's a link to purchase my book and to all the socials. There'll be links to all the podcasts that I've done so far and some writing samples there as well. Um, there is a contact me form there that people want to get in touch with me beyond my email list. I'm hoping to spread some of these classes beyond my medical group um, in the coming months. So that would be a good way to get in touch with me if you're interested. Awesome. This was a lot of fun. Claire, I want to say thank you so much for spending time with me today and for how many times we we like we had a lot of good bloopers in this episode i might include one because it was just so organically funny um with that being said i want to thank you for watching or streaming however you decided to consume this content today this is the saint Clair speak show i'll catch you in the next episode thank you so much yahavi it's been a lot of fun Thank you, Yahavi. I am thrilled to be on the podcast. Um, I, well, the background on, um, uh, sorry. Can we, <laughs> I can't talk. We'll, I can't. we'll get it. We'll get it. <laughs> we'll get it. Hey. You started have, down, you look, like, look, maybe look. I wasn't supposed to say that. Where am I starting from? Okay, we're starting with me introducing myself. Is that what I'm doing? <laughs>